Half your survey data is junk. Let's learn how to fix it. Welcome friends and foes to our inaugural data devotional. We're going to uncover a sad secret of the survey research world today, which is that half of the data that you get back from panel companies, and these are the groups that control individuals that you will send a survey to, individuals you do not know and individuals you do not have contact with most of the time, that half of what you would get back from them cannot be used in analysis. It is literal garbage. But thankfully, there are ways that you can purge these responses from your survey data and get better insights that are more accurate and predictive. And I'll show you how to do that with a checklist and chat GPT. I'm Luciano Pesci. I'm the founder and CEO of Imperitas, customer journey intelligence company, and Nexum, a data ecosystem software solution for SMBs. The problem that we're going to talk about today is talking to strangers. It's that you, as a survey researcher or someone who's interested in getting the opinions of the broad public, don't know individuals. So how do you reach them? Typically, these are lapsed customers for whom you no longer have accurate contact information. They could be your competitor's customers you don't have any information on, or they could be nobody's customers yet. They might even be individuals that you define as never customers that you want to understand. The point is that you do not have an existing relationship and that you have to reach out to them. So what do you do? You turn to the panel companies. These are pseudo monopolies who control a database of people that they say qualify for your research. They say they qualify because they know things about these individuals. So if you provide a list of filtering criteria, they will go to their database and they will come back and tell you their incidence rate, what they think they're going to be able to do as far as the number of surveys that they would be able to complete. It is very typical for a project to have a thousand survey response uh, goal. So they will come back and they'll look at their database and they'll give you a reasonable assessment of that, whether they can reach that 1000. The problem with panel companies is that you don't really know who you're talking to. In some cases, it's intentionally obscured. And as a result, you have to be very thorough in the, res in the analysis of the responses that you get, because it's the only way to figure out if the people that you're talking to are in fact the right people and if they're taking the survey seriously. Those are two separate issues that we're gonna dig into. They're questionable gatekeepers because of their monopolistic position. They have something no one else has. They have asymmetric information. How well you can convey what you're looking for to them and then their ability to honestly give that back to you is part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that all surveys are full of people who aren't taking it seriously or who are intentionally misleading you. The panel companies have this problem, just like any other survey, but the panel companies have it in a predictable proportion, which is that about 50% of what you're gonna get back from a panel company is not usable for analysis and is therefore defined by me as junk. If you'd like to see what this pattern looks like in detail, I've provided two links here, one to a Google Sheet version of the data and one to a Power BI version of the data. Both will allow you to interact with the data that we collected recently on behalf of Silvermint, one of the clients of the data devotionals. And you can see this pattern of 50%. Now this has shown up consistently over time for us with different panel companies, keeping in mind that they have been merging and acquiring one another. So if you're not excluding these surveys from your analysis, the amount of noise that you're introducing into the analysis is about 50%. So the chance that you're going to get to accurate insights is very, very low. Let's connect this problem to the real world. I mentioned that Silvermint recently deployed a survey of crypto users, investors, node operators, and dApp developers whose opinions are needed for an agent-based model. And that agent-based model is simulating tokenomics. If these are terms that mean almost nothing to you, there are two links provided here. The first is to the data devotionals where you can learn more about Silvermint. The second is to a playlist on the Imperitas YouTube channel, specifically for crypto and blockchain, that will walk you through from nothing to a fairly good understanding of what tokenomics is. This was a Qualtrics survey. You can see some of it there on the screen. We were after North America almost exclusively. This is the longitude and latitude data of the survey takers. Almost all of it was in North America. Those that were outside of North America could have been using VPNs or they could have gotten through the panel company. But we were pretty thorough. This thousand is post purge process, which I'm gonna to get to in a moment. Now we had tried email lists, we had tried social ads, we had tried community channels, things like Telegram and WhatsApp and Signal. But those response rates and completion rates which those are jargon, so let me define them here. The response rate is the proportion of individuals that you reached out to who then decide to participate in the survey. The completion rate is either the proportion of respondents who you reached out to that completed the survey or a less stringent definition, because it looks a little better in a metric form, is 
the proportion of individuals who started the survey that completed it. Either way, those are two metrics that are used to guide survey research and to guide how effective a survey is. So when you do something like the soft launch, you will watch those metrics to figure out if people are going to move through the survey to completion like you're hoping in a large enough proportion to reach the quota that you've set. So here's the 1,000 that I mentioned before. We were exclusively after North America, and we could not justify the response rate and completion rates that we were getting from those other channels. It was just too low. The costs were, the response rates were too low. The completion rates were too low and the cost was too high. So we did what everyone else does and we turned to the panel company. We had begun with the other channels specifically because we already knew from prior experience that half of the data that we got back would be junk. We had gone through the same situation a few years earlier with a different panel company that had merged into a different panel company. So this was an independent channel from our previous recent experience, but we've had this experience in other forms and we have seen this in the data that has been handed to us by others who have collected it. So maybe they had a survey monkey survey or they put something out on Qualtrics. They have the data, they want some additional help doing the analytics. When they would give that to us, at least half of the data would usually be junk. The experience felt a lot like Zeno's paradox. If you don't know Zeno's paradox, I'll give you a quick summary with the Achilles and tortoise metaphor that if Achilles sits at the starting line and lets the tortoise run some distance and then has to close that distance. While he's closing that distance, the tortoise will have moved again. And by this sort of paradox, Achilles should never be able to catch up to the tortoise. There's another version that involves an arrow. I don't recommend that you try testing the paradox. It is a paradox because Achilles can catch the tortoise and the arrow will hit you if it's shot at you. Just because you can geometrically for an infinite series go down and down and down doesn't mean that the real world doesn't exist. It's a paradox for a reason, but field work with panel companies, if you decide to send back bad responses, will feel a little bit like this. You'll have a thousand, they'll collect a thousand. 500 will be will be junk. So they'll go out and get another 500. 250 of that will be junk. So they'll go out and they'll collect another 250. 125 of that will be junk. And this pattern will go on geometrically until you get either across the finish line by oversampling, or you just decide that you don't really need 1,000, you'll be fine with 800 or 850 or 900. So you can finish the field work. The paradox doesn't hold, but it will come at the cost of time and some patience. And this is reflected in the data that you can go play with in the Google Sheet or the Power BI dashboard. Four waves of collection, and on average, 50% was junk. So knowing that this was the problem with panel companies, how did we solve it? Two steps, proactively. The first were developed during my time at the university when we were one of the early adopters of Qualtrics, and we saw some of this pattern in survey data. We put together an 11-step checklist that you can use, you can download, here's the link at the bottom left for free, that will walk you through step-by-step step what you need to do. Some of these things can be automated if you're good with scripting or you're good with coding. You could do this in Power BI with DAX. You could do this with R Python. Uh, you can even do some of this now in some of these platforms. The panel companies, to their credit, had some of these measures in place. But as you can see from the data, if you go play within the dashboards, it didn't matter. Half of what we got every time was not usable for final analysis. These 11 steps include one that is very, very time intensive, which is looking through any open-ended responses. So open-ended responses are open fields on a survey where people can type whatever they would like, unstructured text. Sometimes those boxes are limited in the total word count or character length, sometimes they're not. But what makes them unique in a survey is that for analytical purposes, if you have a thousand responses, that's a thousand different opinions. How do you aggregate that into something that tells the story about what's going on. In the past, this was done manually by people. So this step would be done by dividing up the data set to multiple analysts. Those analysts, or often interns, would then have a duplicate set. So intern A and intern B would each have the same 500. Intern C and intern D would each have a separate 500 from A and B, but their 500 C and D would be the same. And then that way you have a thousand being reviewed in duplicate by two analysts. Those analysts would go through and code what each response was saying into categories. They would unify those categories and they would unify their final categorization of the 500 that they shared. So they would do it independently, compare their results, unify them, recategorize them. And then that was how we were categorizing open-ended response. Very time intensive. As one intern described it, it's a special kind of hell because of how monotonous and time intensive it can be. This is also where you have the most opportunity to find individuals who are not taking the survey seriously for whatever reason. Either they're trying to speed through, blast through, they don't care, they weren't supposed to be there, they're intentionally trying to mess with you. The open-ended responses is where you can hunt them out the most easily, but it is a very tedious process. So this checklist 
includes that step. So you can follow this checklist as is, but when you get to that step, you're going to have to do it manually. However, we didn't do it manually this last time. We turned to ChatGPT because 14% of the questions that we asked on this survey were open-ended. We were doing this because we needed to understand the why behind the patterns that we're seeing so that we can best include that in the simulation modeling for each of the agents. On average, the survey takers completed 11 open-ended fields. This resulted in 21,000 open-ended responses. So imagine the division necessary to spread this out in batches of 500 to analysts. Instead, we turned to ChatGPT, which processed the text in batches. So this is each response by response with the prompts. Each batch had a 2,700 word limit, just under 5,000 tokens for a total cost of under $5 or 0.0026 cents per survey. When we were done with the responses, we applied a 30-50 rule. So looking at any one survey taker, if 30% of their responses were coded as joker or didn't care, they were tossed. If 50% of their responses showed that they were disengaged, short responses, I don't know responses, not interested responses, they were also tossed. So by feeding the responses one by one into ChatGPT, and then looking at the totality of responses across that respondent, the survey taker, we applied this 30-50 rule to decide which surveys to send back. And that's how we got to the 50% each time with each wave of collection needing to be sent back and replaced. We've packaged the script that we used to do this up and made it publicly available here at this link below. It is a Python script. You will need your own ChatGPT API key. We used ChatGPT 3.5, which was the latest version during the survey, which just happened. It was just June and July. ChatGPT 3.5 was returning some results that caused errors in the script. So there are notes in there about how we were handling the errors and some suggestions on how to improve that. ChatGPT4 will reduce this issue, but it comes at a higher price. In fact, the $5 we spent would have been $130, and it will take a little bit longer. Though at the scale that we were doing this, that was not really that much of an issue. You can get around this by using fine tuning with 3.5, but some error handling will be necessary to utilize the script that's been provided. So now that you know that half of your survey results are junk, you can do two things. You can go back through the surveys that you've already fielded, you can take your analysis, you can apply the script, and you can find the results that were junk and toss them and rerun your analysis and see if it changed anything. The second thing that you can do is proactive. From this point forward, you can use this script and this checklist to identify junk surveys as they're coming in and send them back to the panel companies to avoid paying for responses that are just muddying the water and making it harder for you to get to actionable information. That does it for this devotional. Leave a comment for topics that you'd like to see me cover in the future devotionals, and I'll see you next week.